Uh, there are some things I could say about my... I've sort of become abstractful to me, uh, but not meaningful in any literary way. But when I look at it, it, it excites me a certain way. There's a certain kind of excitement for me. Some paintings excite me more than others. When they do, then there's always a tendency that you want to continue that, that experience. You want to continue that excitement. So you might make two, another painting similar to it. Uh, if the painting excites you, but it also, in a sense, always disappoints you a little. You never quite achieve in the painting what you'd like to achieve. So you keep on trying for another one. This man, Jack Torkoff, along with five or six others, changed the course of American painting. They sensed something new in painting, and in their exploration, found their way. Today, it is generally called abstract expressionism and recognized as one of the most profound changes to occur in art history. Torkoff is 66 years old, but he has not stopped moving. His new work today is again changing, pushing out into a different place. For the nature and boundaries of abstract expressionism are hardly charted. I, I never really wanted to censor myself too much. That is, I will say this, there are a million things that a painter could paint that he discards, that he never paints at all. I mean, I could have, uh, for instance, uh, been a pretty good portrait painter. Uh, and, I, and I'm not painting portraits. You know, it's a kind of self-censorship. On the other hand, within the area in which I work, I never wanted to exclude things. I never, if, uh, I never wanted to exclude ideas. If I did, it was only out of laziness or uh, out of being too tired to tackle them. If I had all the energy that I wanted, if I could command all the energy possible, I wouldn't like to censor myself at all. I would like to, uh, I would like to paint almost everything I can think of. Uh, and uh, I would like to include as much as possible rather than, than exclude. Tworkov has now become involved with a kind of form, organic form, that comes partly out of his impressions of certain imagery near his summer home on Cape Cod. He is at the start of a long and difficult exploration. What I did, just did today uh, is certainly not an abstract expressionist technique, but for instance, now that I'm getting more interested in, in shape and in drawing, uh, I don't mind at all changing my techniques. Uh, today, I mean, I would use any technique that helped me arrive at a, at a, at the kind of image, or the kind of expression I wanted. I see absolutely, for myself, no reason to censor uh, any real impulse uh, in my work. You know, you see, I've had this sketch print, pinned up there since last summer. And I constantly kept wondering whether or not I could paint it or not, whether it meant enough to me to paint. And yet I, it meant enough for me not to take it off the wall. Sometimes you're so interested in a sketch that you wonder whether there was anything else that, that you could do besides the sketch. Uh, because the one thing you don't want to do is just uh, re paint the sketch, you know, repeat it. Until you've tried to actually paint the sketch, you don't get ideas for changing it. It, 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 seems, it seems to me that a great deal of the, thi of the things uh, are impressions I get from the marshes and uh, sometimes dunes and other places in Provincetown. And I think these probably have some reference uh, to the marshes uh, that lie outside uh, uh, Provincetown. But I wouldn't press the point because literally I don't try to get an image. I don't try for, for an image that relates itself to nature. If it comes in, 
it comes in rather uh, uh, unintentionally. There is another element that enters into them that is kind of very difficult to, for me to explain without a pencil and paper. I became interested in, in, the, in the origin and ending of, of lines. So you can draw a line straight down uh, the center like that. And the most Im interesting thing about the line is that it begins here and ends there. You can then start playing around with this line as if it were made, as if you could stretch it in a way. Let's say, suppose you stretch it in the middle. This line is like this. It's still, the, it's still the same. To me, it's the same line in the sense that it begins in the same place. It goes from the, begins in this, from the same point and ends at the same point. Now, you could do th this to it and it would still be the same line. You know, because it would still begin and end uh, at the same point. And it was ideas, of, and it was suddenly things of this sort that got me interested. Let's say, for instance, you, you, me you mean to go this way. The, the interesting thing about this line is it starts here and ends there. But I can make any kind of variation on it as long as it ends there. And I found out that, I, that by playing around some rather by playing around with this idea, uh, I was able to get a, satisfy my desire for shape in the canvas. Actually, I'm talking about my new work. I mean, I began playing around with this idea. I can't even explain to myself just why, but it satisfied my idea of, of, of having shape without going to, to rigid geometric form. I, a characteristic of my painting has been that I've been avoiding geometry <laughs> of a certain kind. In other words, I was ab avoiding, uh, uh, I was avoiding, uh, you might say, ruled lines, you know? And these things, by, by adopting this idea, it gave me a kind of organic form again, organic shape, an organic, uh, 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 that, that were satisfactory uh, uh, to me. It just simply consists of, of two simple lines, point of origin there to here, with this, and this is the pulled out line. And this, and then there's the point of origin there and point of origin here, almost parallel, like two parallel lines. Then I get this, and I get this, out of two, you know, like the, if, the, if the two lines were simply parallel lines, uh, that is, if you consider the points of origin, and you connected them with straight lines, they would have been almost two parallel lines. And I get this out of that. And uh, now it's not arbitrary because I happen to like the shape. I mean, so in the end, I mean, you have complete uh, freedom in, uh, uh, of choice. In the work that established Jack Tworkoff as one of America's major contemporary painters, the painting itself becomes the subject matter. Stroke application, color, shape, fused together into one total experience. From a formal point of view, the main thing about most of these pictures is that they are built uh, on the idea of the long stroke, which is a kind of an element with which to articulate the surface. For instance, pretty much as you have the dot, say, in Sura, or the flicker of paint in Impressionist painting, or the short stroke of the folds. Uh, and for some reason or other, in my painting, it began to evolve uh, a rather long stroke, which became the, the basic unit at which to build the picture. Even this one, uh, even though it builds up into a solid mass, actually is the crisscrossing and building up out of single stroke uh, uh, painting. I say single stroke, sometimes it requires that you go over the stroke, but as nearly as possible, you try to keep the informality uh, of a single stroke. You, 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 you try to avoid uh, a contrived uh, stroke. You've made a painting or, or two paintings. You see the possibilities uh, for more, 
but also you're kind of exhausted. If you've made one or two, it, you're kind of exhausted, and again, you have a kind of, it's like, it's like you've gone up the hill and down again, now you have to go up the hill again. And so it's always a kind of a tough struggle to come to the third picture, to the fourth picture, and yet you want to. Uh, well, in the meantime, you may be doing something else. You, then you might, you might just for relief, paint something that is altogether quite different, lighter, easier for you. No, the, this, the, the strangest development in my work was the, the red, white, and blue stripe paintings. And, and uh, the stripe didn't come to me as a surprise because I had used this long stroke for a long time. And about 1958, maybe somewhat under the, under the influence of Jasper John's flag when I saw it, I was very much amused by it. I didn't know what he intended by the flag, except maybe I thought it as a paradox, say, as between, as between what painting is and what object is. I mean, I went through a phase sort of like a patriotic phase. I liked the idea of painting red, white, and blue. And I, and I began painting that picture called Sousa, almost with the same idea, you know, like with the same kind of uh, idea of celebrating uh, something uh, democratic, you know. So, so this idea of painting red, white, and blue pictures it became really rather a serious uh, theme to me from that point of, from that point of view. And so for a little while, this thing developed into the stripe thing. Only I was really out of luck because it just happened to coincide with a period when suddenly everybody was painting stripes. And, and of course, I just simply had to give it up. <laughs> uh, incidentally, there's really no relationship at all, say, between paintings like, like uh, Lane and other stripe paintings. Uh, I was not trying to be hard edge. I wasn't trying to be, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, just the opposite. I tried to make those stripes a little bit awkward. I just let them uh, happen any way they happened. And if they came out kind of wobbly and so forth, well, then they, it just made the painting a little bit more moving for me, just a little bit more dynamic. Uh, I wasn't at all interested in making a still painting. Jack Torkoff first visited Cape Cod in 1923 and has been coming back periodically ever since. In 1958, with a market for his work well established, he and his wife, Wally, purchased a house in Provincetown on the tip of the Cape. They spend long summers there. His parents moved from Poland to the States when he was 13, and he was enrolled in high school in New York City, where he found himself taking a course in mechanical drawing, taught by an instructor who made the children draw machine parts freehand. In this way, he discovered drawing. And it took me a long time to understand mechanical drawing. I was a little bit slow on it, but I became very good at, at drawing machine parts freehand. So he picked so he asked me to join a sketch class, which he ran. Uh, one of the boys would get on top of the drawing desk and pose and we would draw him. And I began to enjoy that very much. And then uh, I began going to a na uh, one of the neighborhood settlement houses to draw. But all this without any thought of being an artist. I mean, the, uh, it's strange that you could want to paint, say, and draw and become fascinated with it. And yet, really, you don't go around thinking, I want to be an artist. But when the projects were over and we entered the war, I had three or five years, and I was a tool designer. Uh, and it was while I was tool designing that I suddenly knew absolutely that I wanted to paint more than I wanted to paint than do anything. Well, it's strange. It, you know, you can postpone a decision till the late in life, uh, till after... Uh, I was worked as a tool designer for three years without ever touching a brush. And by the time I got through, 
I knew damn well I, that the one thing I wanted to, to really sp spend my life on before it was too late was on painting. And it did make an enormous difference from then on. My work really, it, uh, really took a definite change. And it wasn't so easy because uh, by that time I was really solidly married and had two children, and the fa and Bolly had to agree to the to that notion. And uh, she was more than helpful at the time. And we decided that that we we're just going to take a chance on being. That I was going to take a chance on being an artist. I rented a studio, a small studio. Everything happened. It was very strange. With a little bit of teaching and some sales, and living very poorly, very modestly, and not so bad. We didn't really ever have a really tough time. We, we were never hungry, and uh, we never. We, all we had to do was we we had, we lived in the same apartment, incidentally, that we live now almost. We just lived uh, modestly. We didn't make too many demands uh, on ourselves, and. Uh, we managed to, the children, I don't think the children were too deprived, but the excitement of, of living from art was just incredible. It was the, it, it's uh, hard for me now to recapture uh, that. The club when it first started was just really a, a, a place for people who knew each other to, uh, to come and have a coffee. Primarily that's what it was. A, uh, to have a drink. I think that uh, it grouped itself around, more or less around Bill de Kooning. He was like a center for something. And the, I think the club really centered around him at, at, in its opening days. But uh, whichever way it started, uh, and nobody really knew at first just how it's going, uh, what was going to happen to it. It developed into uh, into a, a place where suddenly painters began recognizing each other, moving towards each other, where before painters were more or less by themselves and isolated. Uh, the club was a, became a focus for painters to get together, and they kind of discovered each other. And for a while, there really was a, a, a great feeling of friendship, a great feeling of uh, appreciation. There was at that time not much feeling of competition. There was a feeling of emulating each other, of trying to discover something together. Uh, and they, were, they, they, they talk a lot about the lectures at the club and so forth. That was interesting, but the real thing was the endless talk among the painters, among themselves. And uh, I think that this had an enormous influence on, on the painting of the period. Uh, uh, almost as much as the example of the work itself. It was a period when uh, uh, when the main thing under discussion really was painting itself. And I think that this is, it, it was this concern with painting and paint that to a large degree uh, determined the style of the period. I think 1949, I began to sense uh, an in, uh, a certain a kind of excitement. I knew that something terrific was going on at the, at the time, and I was personally very much excited about the possibilities uh, of painting in this country. If I speak of intuition, it, it means that I am guided someplace by some kind of desire some kind of emotion that exists, uh, uh, that is, I I which prompts the, the making. Uh, and this desire m might be uh, one's relationship to nature as one experiences nature. It might be uh, the way one experiences relationships to, to others than oneself, or, the, or even, or even one, the way you experience qualities. If you're going to speak of quality, if you're going to speak of value, then all these things emerge out of our experience of living, of how we experience our relationship to, to, to nature, to things, to the world, to people.
And I think that we experience these things primarily intuitively. I don't think that they are subject to exact rational formulation. Uh, Any time I express my concern, whether I can spe- express my concern for things, or for people, or for the world, I believe that that's essentially uh, is what I mean by religious manifesta- manifestation. No one urges you to have this concern. You feel this concern, naturally. Even, even your concern with what is good or bad in painting, the desire to make good painting rather than bad painting, even this kind of a concern uh, it seems to me uh, fundamentally uh, without motive, unless you can describe it as a religious motive, this concern with quality, this concern with the desire to make, to make something good, whether it's a table or a picture or a form of life, is to me, a, I feel that as, a, as essentially a, a, a religious manifestation, or at least that's what I mean by, re, by religion. I, I feel that I, w- I wouldn't want to put art in the service of any particular thing. I wouldn't want to put it in the service of creed, of politics, of... Uh, in a sense, I do feel that, uh, that the involvement in art is a, is a kind of special thing. And, uh, and for myself, I, I do think that it, that it is in some way related to that side of uh, man that you might call spiritual man. And uh, I believe that someplace uh, 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 art doesn't merely expose life or reflect it. I feel that art is in itself some thing that enters the world, that comes into the world as a special thing. As a, as, a, as a special thing that you can, in a sense, uh, that you can associate with for, for the purposes of expanding your sensibility, of expanding your awareness of perhaps uh, uh, of those qualities in life that, that are for, be- for, for lack of a better word, that I would call spiritual values. Uh, I was brought up in my childhood to, in a in a way that made distinctions between uh, between uh, what was every day and what was holiday, between what was ordinary and what was uh, sacred and and holy. And uh, I can't get over that habit. I believe that there's, there are, these differences exist in life. Uh, uh, and I believe that they exist in art. I, again, don't make any mistake. I feel that the artist is, is sometimes like a priest or a physician. He's permitted to look at everything. He's permitted to handle everything. But I believe that, again, his motivation, the, the, the nature of his attitude towards life, the nature of his respect or lack of respect for, uh, of, of life, is an important element in what art is all about. Uh, uh, a whore might write an interesting journal. Maybe it's uh, worth writing, maybe it's worth publishing, maybe it's worth reading. Uh, to learn something about the nature of the world. But it's a far cry from the kind of thing Sophocles might have written. In other words, uh, there is a constant defense of, uh, of some kind of art because it reflects life. I don't think that's all so damned important. Uh, I, uh, I believe life is made up of the things in life uh, art can come in as a, as a fact in itself. You can create something. You can create something that enters life 
as a fact in itself, not something that reflects life, not something that mirrors, but is in itself a fact in life. I don't feel it that if I paint, I'm painting to reflect life. I paint in some sense maybe to, to create life, to create a kind of life. So I believe about painting, so I believe about uh, art, that it can become a thing in itself. I, I think a, fa a phase in my painting is that I, is that, uh, is that uh, there's a peculiar compensation going on in my painting, where one thing is sometimes overstated, uh, two other things are almost always understated. I think that this, uh, uh, I, I really don't like to hit, the, hit somebody over the head with the picture. I, I, if, uh, if, I, if it comes across that way, it's never any intention of mine. In other words, I, I don't conceive my paintings in, a, in, an, aggre in an aggressive sense at all. Uh, 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 I would rather like the paintings to, if, if I worry about one thing, is whether the painting will, will, will stand looking some, for some time. In other words, not the first impression, whether the first impression is a strong one or not, but whether you can stay with it uh, uh, after a period of time. And I think I've had the experience with people who've lived with my paintings that they, that they have held up over a period of time, those who've had them. And this is, is, uh, uh, makes me feel very good. Jack tends to be a completely completely absorbed in whatever he's doing. He can't go easily from one activity to another, so that if there's a period of gardening, it's gardening, or if there's a period of painting, it's painting. And, oh, I think there, uh, uh, Jack has gained maybe a little bit in confidence from any recognition of the world has given him, but I also think it's been an inner confidence that he himself has realized in, say, the few paintings that he's done that he really likes very much. So he knows maybe he can do another one that's good. <laughs> Jack tends not to talk about his work. He comes home and tries to, to get it, and unless there's an occasion and he says, I think I've got a painting finished. Would you like to come and see it? Oh, I try to keep records. I, I myself have been um, interested in the fate of a painting, so even if, if it were only for my personal satisfaction, I try to keep a record of where a painting went and what happened to it. Because Jack works a long time on a painting. It's nothing you can treat casually. I'd like to know what happens to them. I was just going to say, the paintings are like uh, Jack's autobiography, and I, I tend to be interested in autobiographies. This is N, the National Educational Television Network.